a serious education in the world today without Marx is an admission that what you're studying and how you study is governed more by your fear than by your brain or your intellectual curiosity. It's pathetic. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with Pins the Podcat, who was quite the mischievous little pod imp in this episode. And the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 154, and actually a new t-shirt with uh, Pins the Podcat emblazoned right on it but I'll get to that later. But this episode is with Richard Wolf, who is Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a visiting professor at the New School, where he works on economics in the Marxist tradition. And this is Richard's second appearance on the show, and I loved it just as much as the first, because beyond being extremely knowledgeable, Richard is extremely quick and entertaining, which makes these conversations with him very fun. In our last episode together, which was 127, I believe, we focused on Richard's often Marx-inspired criticisms of capitalism. But in this episode, I tried to stay focused as much as possible on Marx himself and his views and answering some of the criticisms, common criticisms, common criticisms, powerful criticisms of the same. So in that spirit, we began with a terrific summary that I had, I played no part in of Marx's life and thought and influences before getting to the myths and misconceptions about his views, such as the role his writings didn't play in the political structures of communist Russia and China, as well as some criticisms, especially the often cited failures and flaws of 20th century communism. You should keep up with Richard on his website at rdwolf, and that's with two Fs, dot com, and then his own show, Economic Update. And then I'm going to displace the podcast for one moment. I, I realize how ironic it is to hawk or mong uh, a shirt for profit, but to support the show uh, on a podcast about Marxism. But here's the third shirt in Robinson's Fashion Empire, which you can find on robinsonsfashionempire.com. And it is says Robinson's podcast with pins the podcast. And I am ri- riding on the podcast's back. So I hope you like the shirt. I'm really happy with it. And comments, likes, subscriptions, reviews, all those things are extraordinarily helpful. This is my second time talking with Richard and the direction we took was informed by the comments on the episode. So I'm sure if I have my way, we will talk many more times in the future. But I would love to hear what you liked, what you didn't like, what you'd like to hear from in future installments. So now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it, Richard. There were two general threads that came out of the the comments on our last episode, other than how much people liked it. And the first is that for whatever reason, even though you just mentioned to me, you would you might clean up your language. Everyone loved when you swore. <laughs> and the other was the request that we get deeper into Marx and perhaps some criticism of his theories and your views. But just to start off, since the man himself has become more of a legend than a real person and his views, I think, have been really twisted as well. Just who was Karl Marx and what sort of world did he live in to motivate his writings? Okay. Um, Well, let's start with the basics. He was born in uh, 1818 and he died in 1883. So he was literally and quintessentially a man of the 19th 
century. Uh, when he's born, uh, Europe is in the early throes of a transition out of feudalism. I mean, that was well along into capitalism, but he grew up at a time when the implications of the American and French revolutions were really beginning to wash over Europe. And being born um, at, at the juncture between France and Germany, uh, they were coming from the West, moving East across Europe. And he was caught up as a young man in the excitement of a new world that he was already part of and growing into and born into. Feudalism was more and more a memory. Deeply impressed, a thousand years of feudalism left its traces and still does, but for Marx, it was a new world. And to understand his mentality, he was... um the ch he was a middle-class kid, we would nowadays say. He was born to people who were literate. He was born to people who uh, not only expected but supported that he would go to a university, which a very small part of the population at that point even imagined, let alone did. So he was in the, uh, he wasn't super rich or anything like that, but he was a comfortable middle class, we might say, uh, kind of family, went to the school, took it all very seriously. His father was what was called in, in the German, French German area where he comes from, a free thinker. That was very, very, very important in Europe at that time. It meant that you had broken from religion, both from Catholicism and from Protestantism, the, the Lutheran explosion of the church, uh, or if you came out of the Jewish tradition, that the orthodoxy and the re taking religion seriously was something people were proud no longer to do. And there was a community, a sizable one, growing quickly of what were called Freidenkische in German, free thinker, literally free thinkers. Um, and the father was part of that, and the son grew up into that. Um, so he was not part of a, a, a religious background. To give you an idea of what shaped the man, the young man, it was, you know, the music of Beethoven. Try, try to imagine these triumphant symphonies in which people are breaking into a great new world uh, if you're familiar, for example, with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, uh, a choral symphony that includes a whole huge chorus that, that ends that symphony with an ode to joy uh, in which, you know, a new world is being born, in which human beings will treat each other with respect, with equality. Marx took dreadfully seriously as a young man, as many in his generation did, the slogans of the French Revolution, which he deeply admired. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. You know, liberty, equality, brotherhood. Um, in fact, that last part of the Beethoven Ninth Symphony um, is all about brotherhood and what, what all that will mean. So he enters the world of intellect, you know, he becomes a teenager and a young man, um, caught up in the notion that capitalism, the successor system after feudalism, uh, was ushering in as it had promised to do. And by that, I mean everybody from, you know, Thomas Jefferson on over to Danton and Robespierre and uh, all of the great ideologues, you might call them, of the end of feudalism. When the United States breaks away from Britain, governed by a feudal leftover, King George III, they do not, they talk about it, 
but they do not have a kingdom here. As an independent breakaway, they were breaking away not only from the British Empire, but from feudalism, from monarchy, the institutions of feudalism, in order to have a new, free, different society. And, and Marx took all of that very seriously and felt himself and wanted to be part of that. The problem was, for him, that as he went through the university, and for those of you who don't know, he studied philosophy. He went all the way up to the writing of a doctoral dissertation on Greek philosophy. Epictetus uh, was his subject and so forth. Um, and his first job was as a young, uh, what we would here call an assistant professor in a German university teaching philosophy. Okay? And he was headed on to be that. His greatest influence besides the French Revolution, the American experiment, as he could judge it from afar, was the German philosopher who was the dominant influence in the universities of Germany at that time, a man named Hegel, who had developed a kind of peak of German philosophy, building on the great tradition that goes from Immanuel Kant through Schelling to Fichte to Hegel as a kind of dominant influence as it has been both in those who follow it and in those who react against it really ever since. There are very powerful Hegelian influences in postmodernism, in existentialism, in literally every movement of philosophy since that time. And Marx was one of the students and the, his closest friends intellectually and his colleagues were likewise students of Hegel. Okay, so that, that's where he is. The problem arises as he begins to be an adult thinking philosophy professor. He begins to look around. He's interested in the world around him. He's not the uh, ivory tower kind of professor if I can make that distinction, his interests go beyond his specialty. They go beyond the universe of the university to a larger society. And there he discovers, and again, long story short, because we don't have all the time we could take for this, um, he discovers that what capitalism promised in slogans like liberty, equality, fraternity, and let's add from the American Revolution, democracy, to put all those together, that capitalism promised that with the end of feudalism and the arrival of this new capitalist system, they would deliver to the human race what he'd had for so long wanted liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy, a better world. And he looked around and he drew a conclusion, tentative at first, but then across his life, it became deeper and richer, but it was the same conclusion. And that was that capitalism had failed to deliver the promises made on its behalf by those revolutionaries who finished feudalism and ushered in capitalism. That the system had betrayed its own founders. Not, not that unusual in human history, but Marx was the great thinker who made that determination, if you like, in a very profound way, both early in his life and then across the, the fullness of it, as I'll show you in the next few minutes, if there's time for me to do that. Um, 
And so you might say he began to shift his interest from philosophy to what we would nowadays call political economy. Why? Because in his thinking, he wasn't interested, once he had determined that capitalism had betrayed its origins, had failed to deliver on its grand social progress promises, his next logical question, he's a philosopher, is why did this happen? Why did he didn't he he didn't toy with superficial noise? He, he didn't look for the bad people who did the terrible thing of undoing the promise. That's a kind of cheap politics. He he never did that. He he wanted as a philosopher to ask the question, what happened? He 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 didn't question that Jefferson was sincere or that um, uh, the philosophers of the French Revolution, both before the revolution, during the revolution, and after they were genuinely committed to liberty, equality, fraternity. They were moved by those objectives. They thought they were doing that. So what went wrong, he said? And to answer that question, he began to read and think beyond the confines of the Greek philosophy he had mastered as a PhD student. And he found himself drawn into the literatures of history. Sociology, we would call it that now, didn't have those names that history did, but sociology comes later. But we would nowadays, that's what he was reading. And he encountered two things that particularly struck him. The revolutionary literature of the French. You know, for all of the Europeans, to this day, there's a revolutionary impulse in France that is an absolute draw for the European, and for beyond Europe, those who are familiar with it. That's, you know, the French to this day have the yellow vests. The, rich, the French to this day have an enormously powerful socialist and communist population. They're on the street at the drop of a hat. They care about their political life in a way that other European countries look to as a model, although rarely achieve. And Marx early on noticed this too. You know, if you read... Rousseau or Voltaire or Diderot, and remember Marx is an intellectual, he reads a great deal, he's caught up in French revolutionary literature. The other literature he discovers is germane to his quest, again, to understand why the transition from feudalism to capitalism could not or would not deliver on its promises of liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. He discovers British political economy. So those become his three great influences, German philosophy from Hegel, French revolutionary politics, and British economics or British political economy, and above all, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, because those are the great thinkers of economics uh, just before him, literally, you know, a few years. I don't remember exactly when David Ricardo died, but my guess is he died. Uh, Marx was born before Ricardo died. Okay, so there's a continuity there. And so that was Marx's quest. And what he began to do was to try to understand how to get an answer. And in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is to tell you what he found. His answer was developed across the the fullness of his works, which I'll summarize in a moment. His answer was capitalism betrayed its promise not because of an external phenomena that held capitalism back or that constricted its functioning. No, 
capitalism betrayed its promises because internal to capitalism are the mechanisms that block liberty, fraternity, and equality from happening. Capitalism is the problem. It's not the liberation. It's the problem. And that problem is buried right in the core of what's unique about it as a system. And in Marx's mature work, culminating in the great work of his life, which is called Das Kapital, or Capital, um, and again, that's a three-volume work. Marx himself only wrote the first volume. The second and third volumes were notebooks that he kept that were assembled and edited by others later, even though they still appear under his name, uh, his partner, uh, his intellectual partner, uh, Frederick Engels, basically put together the second, and one of their great students, a German Marxist named Karl Kautsky, put together the third volume. Um, but in that work and, and other works of his mature years, he explained what it was about capitalism that frustrated the achievement of liberty, equality, and fraternity. And I don't mind telling you very simply that the, because you can simplify it since he's done all the hard work of figuring it out, the answer was that even though capitalism broke from slavery because it doesn't allow people to own each other or anything like that, and capitalism broke away from feudalism because it blew up the lord-serf relationship that had governed Europe for a thousand years. It broke from them, wanted to break from them, achieved the break from them. But what it didn't understand was that by erecting in their place a relationship in the workplace, in the enterprise, in the factory or the office or the store, an employer-employee dichotomy, you were replicating the lord and the serf, the master and the slave, but with a new name, employer-employee. And in that relationship was the blockage that precluded liberty, equality, and fraternity. It's a very sophisticated argument, very carefully worked out, enormously filled with evidence, examples, logical connections. This is the finest kind of intellectual analytical work. If you've never read through it, if you've never had anyone take you through it, you can't possibly understand it and to substitute a dismissive a notion only shows you're childish. It would be a little bit like having a quick dismissal of other great works like Hegel's philosophy or St. Augustine's confessions or Einstein's discoveries or anything else. The quick, easy dismissal tells us only about you, not about the work you're purporting to dismiss. A serious education in the world today without Marx is an admission that what you're studying and how you study is governed more by your fear than by your brain or your intellectual curiosity. It's pathetic in the literal meaning of the term that for the last 70 years, here in the United States, and let me remind you, I was born in Ohio, I've lived all my life in the United States, I've worked all my life in the United States, I'm talking to you right now from New York City. It's only been fear, otherwise known as the Cold War and its legacy, that have led the intellectual community and the universities to be as hostile and dismissive 
and fundamentally ignorant about what Marx achieved, it's childish. We live in a capitalist world. And those of us of my age have done so all our lives. Marx was and remains the most profound critic of that system that we have. To live in a system and refuse to engage in the work of the most important, serious critic it reflects on you, not on, not on the Marxism. And when I say to you, as I, I will, as I will now, that those works of Marx have spread to every country on this planet. He died in 1883. That means roughly 150 years less since his death. His work, his ideas, have spread on a scale few intellectual movements have in the history of the human race. You'd have to go back to Mohammed or others to talk about a body of work that spreads that fast over the whole globe. Every country on earth has Marxist journals, Marxist organizations, Marxist theoretical political movements, and on and on and on. And I'm not even going to talk because of our limited time about the government's like, for example, the People's Republic of China, which make Marx their intellectual or theoretical uh, founder in some sense. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, it's, it, it's really kind of remarkable that one has to, and, and I, I mean, in no way criticizing you're posing me that questions. You should. You absolutely should. But there's also a sadness that you should, because it should be, you know, the common awareness, not that you agree with him, of course not. You don't read uh, Augustine or Thomas Aquinas or Albert Einstein or Sigmund Freud in order to become a student who repeats it. You want to think about it. You want to interrogate it. You want to integrate it with the rest of your formation as a thinking person, because you don't want to be denied that. You don't want to have that absent from the resources you bring to the contributions you make. To do that with Marx is childish, self-indulgently, self-destructive. It, it weakens the quality of American intellectual life, and it always has. And if you're wondering, since I'm a product of the United States, why I have the interest and have done the reading and can talk to you about any of the work Marx and Marxists have done, it's because I figured that out kind of early in my life. I was lucky. I had some adults when I was young who gave me some reason to be interested in this. But I have to tell you, in all honesty, as a person who went through the elite education of the United States. I went to Harvard as an undergraduate. I went to Stanford uh, in between, and I finished at Yale. It's like a joke. And uh, I had 10 years, two semesters a year, 20 semesters. In one of them, a teacher gave me some Marxism to read. In the other 19, it my teachers at those three institutions behaved as if Marx wasn't there. Extraordinary. And what the historians will look back on this bizarre behavior with the kind of critical opprobrium that it deserves. All right, is that a reasonable <laughs> overview, or would you want me to talk about something else having to do with no that was Carl. that was an absolutely terrific overview and agree or disagree with marx i agree entirely with you that he must be studied 
attempted to be understood and not necessarily agreed with. But this is something that I'm trying to remedy both for myself and others. And then just to recapitulate a bit and then put some questions and ideas on the table uh, for you to weave together. So first, the recapitulation. I mean, he was a consummate intellectual man of the 19th century, shaped by the transition from feudalism to capitalism, and then the consequences of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity, and American democracy. Uh, But they didn't come to fruition. The consequences in the form of uh, capitalism did not produce what the revolutions promised. So I think we're on the same page there. But prior to the critique of capitalism, I'd like to start with his understanding of historical and economical development, economic development. And I'll begin with a quote or two that I came across in, in one of your pamphlets. So Mark said that the this is a really strong claim that the mode of production of material life determines the social, political, and intellectual life process in general. And this leads me to ask just about the the theory of historical materialism. But again, this, this other point that I wanted to add to this, that he also said, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. And and this this goes in hand, hand in hand with the, the prior quote. But what I wanted to add to it was that you mentioned already that Marx's writing is filled with evidence, with examples, with logic. But one of the biggest criticisms of Marx stems from, I think it's inherited from Popper, who says that his his theories just, they're not falsifiable. Literally any economic development could be sort of twisted to to fit his theories. And I was wondering just how you respond to this cluster of, of thoughts. Good. Um, before I begin, let me respond to one thing you said, just be, because I don't want to leave uh, a, a, an impression that might come otherwise. Okay. I stressed Marx's contributions, his writings, his thinking, his philosophical journey, if you like. But Marx was unlike other intellectuals because, especially important here in the United States, he did not spend his life in the university. In his early job, he got involved with local workers in the German city where his university was located. And to make a long story short, he got fired from his university position because he wrote about and supported workers who were beginning to struggle against their employers, which was also how he got into economics, trying to understand why those workers were in that position. And for the rest of his life, he was a political activist, not a university professor. He met with social movements, particularly then the labor movement, and then later on the early forerunners of the Socialist Party in Germany, because the Socialist Party in Germany in the second half of the 19th century was the most developed and powerful socialist party anywhere on earth at that time, partly because of his writings, but in turn, they shaped him as well as he shaped them. And he organized, helped organize like-minded people. For example, in the 1860s, he organized uh, the internet, what was called then the International Working Men's Association later called the First International, in which Marxists, they didn't call themselves that then, but people he felt compatible with his own thinking from many European countries, and later on, including also the United States and so on, got together. And not only did they get together to have conferences and debates, but they organized campaigns. To give you an idea, in 1870, Marx is in his prime, they were instrumental in helping to produce what was called the Paris Commune, arguably the earliest takeover of a government 
by self-conscious socialists. Up until the 1870, they had been a critical perspective within capitalism, but in for a few months in 1870-71, they got to take over the city of Paris, and they ran it. And there we had, for the first time, the word socialism with a new meaning. It's not a critique of capitalism. It is an alternative to it, which was a whole new idea. And the whole history of socialism and of Marxism ever since 1870 has been, among other things, navigating the complex differences and tensions between a movement, socialism, that is a critical perspective on capitalism versus a movement about socialism that sees it as an alternative social organization to capitalism. Those are different projects and different, they're linked, but they're quite different. And navigating that difference is partly due to Marx himself in his life, having a one foot in the intellectual, academic, theoretical world, and another foot in concrete, practical activism. He actively advised the leaders of the Paris Commune, what to do, what not to do, and so caught up in that. And many of us who have learned from Marx have replicated this one foot in the one, one foot in the other. So, for example, I've been a professor of economics all my life. I do that now. But I also ran for mayor of the city of New Haven, Connecticut. I've been an active politician too. And I didn't find this a di you know a diversion. I didn't do it as a amusement. I did it out of the assumption, which was proven true, that I could learn a great deal about my theory by getting practically involved and vice versa. The isolation of theorists in the university does their theory no good at all. Okay, now the criticisms. Hmm. Well, he had skin in the game, though. That, that's an good. important point. That, 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 I think, is a nice summary. All right. The critics of Marx are as old as Marx. The critics of Marxism are as old as Marxism. By the way, the critics of capitalism are just as old as capitalism. And if you want a guarantee of the future of socialism and Marxism, here's what it is. As long as we got capitalism, it's going to do what it has always done, which is to provoke the critics. We won't soon have another Marx. That's a tall order. But we've had a lot of folks get pretty close, and more of them are coming, I can assure you. All right, so the critics have always done a variety uh, of things. So let's go through, you know, two or three of them. Does Marx emphasize class struggle? Yes. Does Marx want to stress the role of the material reality? You know, the, the hard facts of life, feeding yourself, clothing yourself, sheltering yourself, as being somehow more important than the ideological. That in German, uh, Bertolt Brecht captured this. By the way, if you're familiar with Brecht, he was a Marxist. Many of the people that Americans, particularly intellectuals, admire and follow get sanitized by the peculiar mentality of Americans so that you appreciate them cleansed of their Marxism, as if the Marxism wasn't part of it. Bertolt Brecht is arguably one of the greatest um, writers of, of theater in the last century or two. He's a Marxist, always was, committed to Marxism from the beginning. And he has wonderful lines, one of them in German, Erst kommt das Fressen, dann kommt die Moral. 
in English. First, you have to eat something. Then we can discuss morality. In other words, the profundity of real life shapes the thinking. Material facts first. Yeah. Materialism determines ideas, not the other way around. Or we must turn Hegel on his head. The idea being Hegel thought ideas of the spirit is what's real and it shapes our delusion about material reality, which is governed. It's not so far from Christian ideas that in the beginning, God made everything. A spiritual entity produced the material reality we all live in, us included. So why does Marx stress it? The answer, and Marx gives this answer himself, part of the reason that kind of a criticism survives is that the people who make it are so unfamiliar with Marx's work that it doesn't seem to dawn on them that this criticism that they've just figured out might have been figured out by others before them. And some of those others might have confronted either Marx or Marxists after him with that idea and gotten some response so that the, before you throw the criticism out again, avoid being embarrassed by having someone like me, for example, have to explain to you painfully that Marx himself responded to that criticism. You don't have to agree with him, but don't quite present your criticism as if it were this sharp new insight when it's an old, dull, and dead insight. All right, here we go. Marx responds by saying, literally almost in these words, Engels and I, my partner and I, may be appropriately criticized for having overstressed the material relative to the ideal. Let us explain to you why we did that. We didn't do it because the material is more important than the ideal. That idea is silly. We did it because we live in a culture that overstates the reverse and to push back against the idealism that governs the, the religious kind, God made the world, or the secular kind, Hegel's effort at a reasonable way to think of the world as fundamentally spirit. So we overstressed the other side to kind of balance the conversation. But we don't believe in the one is more important than the other. That's an empty debate for us. It has no content that we can grasp. We think that the idea shapes the material and vice versa in a continuous process of mutual transformation. And for that comp complex idea, they borrowed the old world dialectic. We understand that the different aspects of life shape each other and constantly change each other so that A changes B, which therefore alters how B impacts A, thereby changing A, which thereby alters how it affects B in a continuous process, which is not only dialectical, but which constitutes what we as human beings call history, change. The only thing that doesn't change, Marx once quipped, is the process of change itself. And then quickly corrected, but change too changes how it works over time. So the notion that, that you know they made one the dominant over the other misunderstands what he got from Hegel, which is where that dialectic idea comes from. Yes, he overstressed it. 
to say the history of you know human history is the history of class struggle, why would you put your focus on class like that? Because it's more important than other things? No. As a Marxist, which I am and happily say so, I can assure you, I focus on class analysis. If you've read any of my books or my articles, you'll see that. Do I think class is more important than other aspects of life? Not at all. In fact, it makes no sense to me. Class is part of life. So is eating, drinking, dancing, praying, wondering, dreaming, and a million other things. I can't talk about a million other things. I would become incoherent to you and to me. So I focus on some things, like class in my case. But not because it's more important. You know, in order for me to argue that class is more important, or for you to argue that anything else is, you'd have to show me how what you're focusing on is more important than everything else. You've never done that. That's not doable because you can't do it. And I can't either. So we focus on particular things for the reasons that shape our lives. So I focus on class, like Marx, because in my education, in the society I live in, which here in the United States is yours too, it is a lost, denied, marginalized reality. And I don't like that. And I think terrible social consequences flow from that. So I focus on class. And I find Marx really interesting because he helps me do that. But it's not that class is more important. That's a silly argument. It's like asking me, what color is Thursday? That doesn't work, folks. There is no correct answer to that question. Which is the more important factor shaping the world is another empty question. You can't do that. Nobody ever has. If you're persuaded that something is more important than something else, the important thing for you to ask is why you believe that. But to say, I'm going to prove it, I'm going to show, you can't do that. Or to say the same thing another way, and this is the answer to Karl Popper, when you explain why you focus on, I don't know, love or race or politics or class, you will make use of ways of thinking that help get you to that point. But those are always play, ways of thinking that started somewhere. And where you start isn't a place that you can prove you should start at. Because the only way you can explain to me why you start at a certain place is to use the analytic that you developed from the place you started at. And that would be proving something by reference to itself. And if you have a had a logic class, you got a problem here. Or to say the same thing in English, we all start from certain places. We have to start somewhere. And if we don't like the place we start, we can start somewhere else. But the notion that some of us start in the right place because it's the right place to start, that's pure dogma. There's no basis for that. Wherever you start, I can ask you why you start there. Wherever you start, I can say, you know, you could start somewhere else. That's always true. You could. People do. Marxists start with class. You don't have to. The interesting question is, why would you? Equally interesting, why wouldn't you? you got to start somewhere. Most of us, you know where we start? Where our parents and our environment tell us it's appropriate to start. And that's okay, but that's not some beyond discourse place. That's the honest answer 
I am what I am because of the autobiography I could take your time to present to you as to why I did that. Karl Popper's criticism in that way is useless. So two things. Marx's emphasis on class struggles you interpret as a uh, an emphasis for pragmatic purposes. And then the emphasis of the importance of material facts over ideal facts is just to push back against the various forms of idealism that were prominent at the time. But one, one criticism that I hear all the time is, well, the first thing that happens when you mention Marx to a non-Marxist is something like this. Marx is the biggest failure of academia or econo economics because he's directly responsible for the deaths of millions with the catastrophic failures of the Soviet Union, China, Cambodia, and so on. And because I'm not educated about Marx, one of the biggest surprises for me that came from reading your work is that I had not realized that Marx never said much about what should happen after capitalism. He was more concerned with the, just criticizing capitalism. And if this is true, then I think that's a huge misconception because lots of anti-Marxists hold him personally accountable for Stalin, the communist Chinese genocides, and so on, as if he directly like wrote up their socioeconomic policies. Yeah, let me respond. I mean, I agree with you. I, I won't go over saying it. Marx never wrote a book about communism. He never wrote a book about socialism. Uh, the one title that has the word socialism in it, uh, a pamphlet really more than a book, was called Socialism, Utopian versus Scientific, a, a, a short book, you can call it, released in the middle of the 19th century, it was mostly written by Engels, but Marx had some play in it. But it was a critique of different kinds of socialism. It wasn't about a, quote, socialist economy. As I say, the only effort at a socialist economy that happened in Marx's lifetime and did get his attention was the Paris Commune. But that was a socialist society that lasted, I don't remember exactly, but somewhere on the order of three or four months in Paris. And then it was overthrown by the returning French army under Napoleon, uh, you know, the... the nephew and grandson of Napoleon. Anyway, uh, so yeah, holding Marx responsible would be roughly as follows. From the year, let's say, 1500 to 1800, there were countless wars between Christians of one kind or another and either other Christians, Protestant versus Catholic, for example, or if you go back a little earlier, wars of Christians against Muslims, the so-called Crusades, and so on. The leading armies of these Christians took their inspiration, they said so, from the Bible, from the utterances, as best we can get them, of Jesus Christ, among others, as, as recorded in the Bible. So I should what? Conclude that I shouldn't be a Christian because millions of people were killed, because they were, in the Crusades and in the Hundred Years' War, Thirty Years' War, all the wars of Protestants and Catholics which shaped modern Europe were all done in the name of Christianity. Are you going to blame the Christians? is bizarre. The worst war in the history of the world so far, in terms of the sheer brutality deaths, is the First World War. Tens of millions of people, combatants and civilians, were killed. These were wars by countries that were Christian. All of them. On all sides. There were no appreciable Marxists in those days. 
and they didn't have any power, though those that were might have called themselves that. So what should I say? Capitalism kills millions? Here's another one. For the last, I don't know, eight centuries, the world has been beset by something called colonialism. Huge portions of the world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, were invaded, taken over, and run by white Christian people, whether you're talking about India or Africa or you name it. In the course of that, tens of millions, probably more like hundreds of millions of people died directly or indirectly because of what these Christian people did. Should I say Christianity has on its hands the blood of... I mean, I could do that. There is some sort of link here. But Marxism or socialism have no special standing in this kind of argument. There's nothing unique. Did the killings in Russia or elsewhere, done by people who saluted Marx, show that there's some link? Yeah, there's some link. Just like I did between Christianity or the writings of Jesus Christ, etc., etc., in colonialism, World War I, or for that matter, World War II. Let's remember, World War II, every combatant country, with one exception, was capitalist. The one exception, the Soviet Union. They weren't. But they were not the only player in World War II. Remember, it was mostly about the United States, Britain, and Western Europe against Germany, Italy, and Japan. So all of those countries are capitalist countries. So capitalism... The era of capitalism has been by far the bloodiest. I would tend to connect that dot to the other dot. So I find it always this bizarre logic in which you find a link between Marxism in Russia, Stalin and all that, and terrible things that happened there. It seems to me very reasonable to say, hey, terrible things happened there. Why did they? What is the link between the terrible things that happened and the ideological framework of that society? Perfectly reasonable question. I wrote a book in my life called Class Theory and History, which tries to explain how and why in the Soviet Union those things happened. I think that's a reasonable demand to put on anybody, Marxist or not. But then to play the game as if these horrors were something done by the people you don't like or don't agree with, whereas you are sitting in the beautiful, clean, vanilla chair explaining this, that's disgusting. That's, that, that's beyond, that doesn't need a refutation, that needs to be ridiculed. I don't want to offend anyone. On the other hand, I'm trying as politely as I can to say that is a cheap shot that tells us more about you than it does. You know, there's a, um, there's a fellow named Jordan Peterson. You may know him. He goes around repeating this. And what I love about it, I mean, he's not unique, but I, I like the way he does it because he does it as if it's a settled matter. It's that style of an argument in which in order to make your case, you act as if everybody in the world understands this thing you're about to repeat so that your opponent should feel not just that you are in disagreement, but the whole universe. Uh, everybody knows. The minute you hear that from anybody, Marxist, non-Marxist, you should reach for your wallet before that guy gets his hand in it, because this is a hustle and not a it's not serious kind of uh, debate. It is entirely anti-Paparian in a sense. I mean, the capitalist governments, as you said, they're also responsible for unimaginable death and destruction. Yet the critics I was referring to 
totally neglect this evidence and focus on yeah. Russia, yeah. China, et cetera, as if these were the only instances of yeah, crimes yeah. against humanity. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's really, it's beyond words. And especially, you know, both China and Russia, their socialist governments, which leave loads to be desired. I'm a critic of them. I've written, I mean, all of that. But put that aside. Both of those socialist societies, as they define themselves, came out of revolutions against unbearable social conditions, all of which seems to be forgotten. If you're interested in where the Chinese communist revolution comes from, there's an American missionary, a woman named Pearl Buck, who wrote a famous novel 50 years ago, or however when it was, called The Good Earth. Just read how China was before the revolution. The, the, the deaths every day, the, the misery for centuries. That's what the revolution was against. You want that revolution, which had some violence in its unraveling, and many injustices, no doubt. But where are you coming from with this bizarre from on heights declaration? The minute you talk to folks, you discover they have no idea where this Ru Russian revolution came from, where this Chinese revolution. Why do you think people have revolutions? Because things are going real well? Uh-uh. It's when they're not. And then you have to wonder, well, what does that mean? Gee, well, it turns out it means lots of suffering for a long time for many people. Now the whole numerical calculus of who hurt how many people when becomes fuzzy. And your invocation of this fuzziness, as if it weren't fuzzy, as if all the bad news was over here and there was nothing else to worry about, to think about, again, that reflects on you not on the situation you're talking about. So anyway. So granted that Marx did not advocate some particular post-capitalist form of economic or political organization, I mean, the question arises, though, just how we should interpret the failures of many of the attempted purported instantiations of his theories. And I'm wondering if what you're suggesting is that much of the suffering should be attributed to the conditions of what came before. But I'm also wondering if any aspects of these... No, 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 no. I, I didn't say that, and I, I don't want to be understood as that. Oh, okay, clarify yeah. that, please. Yeah, Sorry. Clarify. No, I think it's a lapse. It's, it's a cheap shot. It's not valid. And it involves erasing other kinds of history that would make what you're saying ridiculous. So you avoid recognizing. So that's out. No, I think there are failures. The word is a little messy, but okay, there are failures in the Soviet Union, and there are failures in the People's Republic of China, or for that matter, North Korea, Cuba, Vietnam, or any of the other countries that nowadays... Oh, wait, Richard, just to make sure that I understand, you were saying that as opposed to attributing the the suffering that happened in these regimes to what happened in the past, what you were just saying is that we can't act as if this was what happened in these regimes was the only bad thing. I mean, things were terrible uh, prior to the communist revolutions, too. No, but it, yeah, but that was a secondary point. My major point was, if you want to play the game of counting deaths, then count them everywhere. Yeah, okay, great. That, that was the... Stop this game in which you think you've achieved something by pointing to them and their bad story, their bad facts, their horrors. Unfortunately, the horrors are all over the place, and you're not coming from a place that is clean and viewing a place that is dirty. That's a convenient way to advance your political agenda, but it holds no water. Okay. Well, let me... Okay. Let me Great. Uh, in order to understand how to go about talking about Stalinism or deaths or any other negative quality, you have to kind of ask yourself what this reference is, which I get to, socialism has failed 
What are you talking about? Let me give you an example of why this makes no sense. If you were, and there are studies that can back me up if you want them, if you were to ask the majority of the people on this planet at any time over the last 75 years, what's the number one priority of your society? The answer would be, we want to stop being poor. We want to stop being the way most of the people in Asia, Africa, and Latin America are, which is without huge portions of what people in the United States take for granted. Food, clothing, shelter, education, transportation, all of that. Okay. So the highest priority is to develop your economy and your society so that average people are healthy, can live a reasonable long time, get a good education, have their health care taken care, etc. Okay. Now let me put on my hat as an economist. Okay. Over the last 40 years, from the 1980s to the present, one country in the world has grown faster than all others. No one's close, and they were the largest country on this planet. They went from being one of the poorest countries in the world to now challenging the United States. It's the People's Republic of China. In terms of the highest priority those people had in their poverty situation a hundred years ago, socialism is the best thing that could happen to them. And they know it. And their regime is very solid and very secure because of it. Real wages in China over those last 40 years have quadrupled. A real wage is when you adjust the money a person gets as pay for their work in terms of the prices they have to pay when they use the money. So the real wage measures how much can you really get to consume from whatever your wage is. Over the same 40-year period, the wages, average real wage in the United States went up about 10 to 15%. Let me do that again. The real wages in America, on average, went up 10 to 15% over 40 years. The real wages in the People's Republic of China over the last 40 years went up 400%. Do you think there's a difference here? Who's failing? What are you talking about? By the way, I'm not endorsing Chinese society. Are they full of criticism? Do they have flaws? Absolutely. But the make-believe that goes into the kind of logic you're talking about is based on a carefully cultivated ignorance. It's just ignorant. They have no idea what happened in China, nor do they care. They need to affirm one is good and one is bad. Childish. It's really childish. By the way, in the 20th century, the most spectacular economic growth was achieved by the Soviet Union. In 1917, at the time of their revolution, they were the, one of the poorest backwaters of Europe. Anyone who had ever traveled there, chronically, I mean, there was no, the 5% of the people were literate. Everybody was a peasant in the country. There were no roads. There was no electricity, all of that kind of stuff. And within 70 years, and despite two world wars fought on Russia's uh, surface, on its land, they were the number one contestant of the United States. Okay, does that mean the Soviet Union was wonderful? Of course not. But when you use the word failure, what's your standard? What's your metric? Where do you come from with this? You know? You know what this is? This is just hostility, which, by the way, may be justified. I'll never know. But what's coming at me is noise, junk, silly stuff that, that you kind of ought to be ashamed is coming out of your mouth. I don't mean you personally, but someone who says that sort of stuff. It, it's, it really, it's really kind of childish. By the way, 
Today, the world economy, let me just be very topical with you for a moment. The world economy today is different from what it was 10 years ago, let alone 20 or 40. After World War II, the United States dominated the world economy. The United States was, as Marxists like to say, hegemonic economically. This is a footnote. Hegemony as a, cal- as a c- concept to govern all this, that's a concept that was developed in its modern form by a Marxist, an Italian Marxist named Antonio Gramsci, who was imprisoned by Mussolini and basically killed in prison. But he was the leading Marxist, Italy, the most important Marxist theorist ever produced in Italy, and it's produced a lot of them. Gramsci developed, while he was in prison, books you can get, Columbia University Press in the United States has a complete collection of, I think, a dozen volumes of the writings while in prison of Antonio Gramsci. By the way, footnote, because you want to, people will find this interesting. The edited volumes of Mr. Gramsci were... uh, the volumes were edited by um, a man named Buttigieg, who was a professor. He's passed away. He was a professor of literature at Notre Dame University in Indiana, Joseph Buttigieg. He had a son named Peter Buttigieg. Uh Uh-oh. Peter Buttigieg, a spokesperson for the Biden regime, comes from a family whose father dedicated a major part of his life to the translation and publication of the works of Antonio Gramsci, who was for a while the head of the Italian Communist Party. Here in the United States, you'll find people who know and use the work of Gramsci, including the concept of hegemony, having carefully avoided learning where it comes from, what context it works within, what intellectual tradition it depends on, etc., etc., etc. The influence of Marxism is everywhere. And one of the reasons people don't understand it is because often the people who have it in them find it is necessary in this strange country to hide it. I'll give you another example because there's a certain twinkle in your eye that suggests I should go further with this. <laughs> Kamala Harris is the vice president. She has a father named Donald Harris. He's a Marxist economist that I have worked with much in my life. He used to be a professor at Stanford. One of the few Marxists that Stanford dared bring into its framework. But who admits what they did? Complicated. All right, let me go back to to where I was. So if your metric is economic growth in a society that says that's our number one priority, then socialism isn't a failure. Or you have to qualify that somehow. You can't say socialism is a failure as if somehow this makes any sense because I just gave you a framework within which it's wrong. It just makes no sense at all. So I wanted to jump to the current global situation. The United States was dominant from 1945 to around 2015. Then it's over. Why do I say that? Because the world economy today is no longer dominated by the United States and its few major allies. Nowadays, the United States and its few major allies are known as the G7. You'll see headlines in newspapers about the G7. The G7 is the United States, Britain, France, Germany, and Italy, Japan, and Canada. That's that. That used to be 
The United States, its allies, dominate the world economy. They don't anymore. There's a second block. It has a name. You haven't seen it very often yet, but you will. It's called the BRICS, B-R-I-C-S. If you pay attention to such things, you'll know that that stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Those five nations. China and its allies. They recently added six more countries. So it's now an 11 country block. If you add up the size of an economy, and the, the number we use in economics for that is called the GDP, stands for gross domestic product. It's a, it's a rough count of the total quantity of goods and services your economy produces in a calendar year. Well, if you add up all the GDPs of all the countries in the G7, U.S. and its allies, it adds up to about 29% of the total output of goods and services in the world today. And if you do the same for the BRICS, it adds up to 33%. You notice something is different. The BRICS is a bigger economic unit. We've not had that before. The, the lines crossed in 2020. And since then, since that part of the world is growing much faster than this part. Okay. So, by what standard again is the so socialist world a failure? What? What are you talking about? Do you perhaps mean health care? No, that doesn't work out so well. They have mostly universal health care in those socialist countries. What about education? No, they're pretty good uh, on that. Civil liberties. Ah, good. You got one. They're not so good on that. That's a flaw. That's a criticism. You may. That, I'm okay with that. I have no problem. I don't expect societies to be perfect. I certainly don't argue that they are. I don't do it for our side. I don't do it for their side. But I don't permit, I can't, if I'm going to be intellectually honest, or at least try to be, to allow things to be said that are bizarre. And now there's another point. I'm not sure you were going to go here, but just in case. And if you don't, maybe this is an invitation to think about doing it. Socialism is not a universally agreed upon idea. In other words, when anyone says socialism hasn't worked, my first reaction, I try to, I try to stay calm and cool and collected. But my first reaction is, whoa, are you perhaps not aware that from the beginning, socialists have not agreed on what the word means. They never did. They don't now. What one country means by socialism is not identical to what another one does. And once you understand that, posing the question, socialism in the singular is a failure, becomes nonsensical. What do you mean? Which one? Let me, is this worth exploring? Sure, sure, please. All right. Here's one example. Many countries in Scandinavia and Western Europe, and I'm thinking here of Sweden, Denmark, France, Germany, Italy, will be referred to either as socialist economies by some, or as social democracies, a kind of variation on that, or as democratic socialisms. I mean, large numbers of people use those descriptors all the time. And here's what they mean. Most industries in those societies that I mentioned, those countries, remain privately owned and operated. 
On the other hand, in those societies, the government has intervened to control, to regulate, to tax in, in, in a pretty intrusive way on what those private enterprises can do. And the reference to them as socialist is a reference to the amount, intensity, and intrusiveness of the government controls and regulations upon what remain private capitalist enterprises. And that is called often Scandinavian socialism, social democracy, and so on. When Bernie Sanders, who self-identifies as a socialist, gives examples, he prefers to use Denmark over and over again, publicly. So that's one idea of socialism. Now we go to the Soviet Union, quite different in a crucial aspect. They not only have the government control, regulate, and tax the way they do in Denmark, but they go another step. The government takes over the enterprises. The government owns and operates the enterprise, not private capitalists. And they call that socialism in the Soviet Union. USSR stands for Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Then we have China, which is a hybrid. China has 40% publicly owned and operated enterprises, 60% private capitalist owned and operated enterprise, and a powerful government regulating both of them. They all call... China refers to itself as socialism with Chinese characteristics. Okay, which one are you talking about? And then there's a fourth one, which is rising fast in the world today, which is a bit of a criticism of the first three, because it argues that those discussions of socialism may, note the word, may be necessary but they are certainly not sufficient. Socialism to be socialism in this fourth perspective has to have a transformation of the workplace, the factory, the office, the store, from a top-down, hierarchical, unequal relationship between employer and employee to a horizontal, democratic organization of the enterprise something that would look like what we in this country like to call worker co-op. Okay, which, which socialism, pray, te, pray tell, are you criticizing? Your hostility to socialism is so total and so ignorant that you just lump all of this together and declare it a failure. You know, that's childish. It it's reeks of the ignorance you either have because you don't know what I just said, or you really don't care, which does you no compliment either. It's extraordinary. And you know, in another society or on other topics, the people involved in these discussions would not behave this way. If I breezily said in the course of such a conversation, how boring Shakespeare is, there'd be someone in the room, I hope, who would explain to me, I mean, Shakespeare wrote a lot of stuff. Really? All of it? You don't... And then would tell me about it. And I'd get embarrassed because I had really spoken stupidly. So we don't allow people in certain areas to talk. But the absence of a culture of studying Marxism and talking about it has allowed our intellectual community to babble junk as if they were serious in a way that, frankly, I find embarrassing. I often don't say anything because, you know, this is, this is having an in-depth conversation with a, a brick of cement. You know, after a while, it gets boring. 
I don't, I, by the way, I don't mean to be aggressive, but part of this conversation should be not just the words I say, but the tone and the style and the intonation and the facial expressions, because they convey a lot of meaning also. Mm -hmm. And you're a, a wizard with that. I love listening and watching you talk. I'm sorry for bringing us back to this, but I think in addition to everything else we've covered, if we can nail it down, it would be a huge accomplishment. But you mentioned Jordan Peterson and people like him who take it to be a done deal that socioeconomic organizations purportedly inspired by, by Marx have been abject, total, violent failures. And you've given good reasons to look at how other socioeconomic organizations have fa fared as a foil and but still that the purported Marxist instantiations have succeeded in other metrics. But the critic like Jordan Peterson, I'm sure, will still point to the violence at home committed against citizens or other groups. And again, this happens places like Nazi Germany, too. But how do you explain these failures in, in Russia or China? And do any of them point to a falsification of some dimension of Marx's views? No, I think there are problems with Marx's views, all kinds, areas he didn't go into, um, areas where his arguments are incomplete, areas where he made misjudgments that need to be corrected. And there's a vast Marxist literature that does all of that. Marxists have not been shy at all of dealing with all, all the criticisms you've just made and many, many, many more. I know I've gone through a lot of that literature. I could you know, tell you about it. Because Marxism spread all over the world, the number of interpretations of Marxism are legion. Any idea or body of ideas like Marxism that spread to every country on earth in the matter of 100 years, 150 years, would mean that these ideas entered vastly different countries in terms of their economics, their politics, their culture. And each of them reading Marx would react or interact with the, what they're reading in their own way. Chinese Marxism is not Nigerian. Marxism, and neither of them look like what the Guatemalans do with it, etc., etc. So the very notion of socialism or Marxism as having some core, solid thing that everybody shares is open to a lot of debate. And even if you could whittle down what they maybe all have in common, I could think pretty quickly, I'll show you, they don't and they haven't always, and therefore they may not tomorrow. And I don't, I guess I don't understand your question. What violence exactly are you pointing to done by whom? So, for instance, I just did an episode with Norman Neymark, a historian here at Stanford, about the world history of genocide. And we talked about in the Chinese revolution. Uh, for instance, there were these huge uh, agrarian communes in which people starved by the millions to death. And a large part of this, I think if I recall correctly from reading the book, because we didn't really discuss it, was the government decided not to distribute food that they had to the poor agricultural workers, but to export it because they would get more money. Or we didn't talk about Cambodia, but I recall that the powers that be sort of othered all intellectuals and had them rounded up and murdered, this sort of thing. Did that happen? Uh, my guess is it probably did. Yes. I don't know who this historian I mean, is. People would be singled out for having uh, glasses because they were intellectuals. Yeah, you know, every social movement, every social movement that I've ever studied has exhibited moments, incidents, activities like that. 
Right now in Great Britain, I'm going to give you different examples. There's a parliamentary commission that has just issued a report, literally today or yesterday, about the behavior of British military in the Afghan war that went on 10 years ago and is bringing up for trial the literally dozens and dozens of British soldiers who murdered children. What am I supposed to do with this? Do British soldiers murder children? Under some circumstances, evidently, they do. Had I never known about this report, which anybody listening to this can Google and find out the details yourself, I would have assumed I could find it if I went to work looking for it. You know, we have our My Lai Massacre, we have our Guantanamo torture chambers, we have, and we have every right to point them out and to talk about them. But the leap from that to the notion that one is in a position to do what? What do you do with the factuality, assuming you can establish it? Let's assume there were instances where a government decision was made to export food that might have fed starving people. Why did that happen? There's nothing, neither in socialism nor in Marxism, that warrants that, justifies it, proposes it, advocates it. Stop! Just like there's nothing in the United States as a society that says, go out there and torture. Go out there and slaughter people. No, 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 no stop! You're drawing an equation in a kind of childish logic in fact, officially, you're against all those things. Does that mean they won't happen? Of course not. Of course not. That's why the British, to their credit, are willing to say, wow, we have to... Even Tony Blair, a politician whose level of, of public lying is really impressive, had to, at a certain point, admit that when he said he knew the Americans had found weapons of mass destruction in Iraq as the premise for invading that country was lying. He's actually, yeah, I lie. And why did I lie? Because then he had a, an explanation. And if you like him enough, that was sufficient. If you were an enemy, you could say, see, in Britain, they, they, they propose that the politicians lie. Well, no, they don't do, do politicians lie. Yeah, a lot. And they don't just do it in one kind of society or another. That's a problem. How do you deal? In other words, it, there are ways of, of coping with these kinds. Of, it's this effort to use such things. And, you know, wow, you better have a lot of argumentation which these folks never do, at least not in my experience, why I should go with you from a horrible incident where I agree with you it's horrible to something about the whole society's structure or makeup. Look, you could say it about early United States. When the Europeans come here, they systematically commit genocide. They take the indigenous people. Look, today's Columbus Day or whatever, yesterday. They take the indigenous people and they slaughter them. They're pretty clear. The Nazis did that with a whole set of categories of people that they wanted off the face of the earth and they buried them or they gassed them in chambers, etc., etc. Yeah, there are cases. But then there are other situations where terrible things happen, but you don't conclude this is quite a genocide. You know, it's terrible. It's not an exoneration, but you have categorical differences that matter. That's why, for me, these conversations are the bizarre effort of people who should know better wanting to hold on to pretty primitive goods and bad stories and so they make up something to rationalize it. They find something really bad, which may be true, and then they've got what they want, 
the thing that warrants the wholesale dismissal. It, as I say, it very, very bizarre. Nothing, again, nothing after World Wars One and Two has been as horribly destructive of human beings as those two events. They're called world wars for a reason. And there's some restraint between Russia on the one hand and the United States and Ukraine on the other right now because using nuclear weapons is the next world war that really, that's stupid we aren't. Only one country on earth has used nuclear weapons. That's the United States. Twice. Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Two, two atomic bomb killing hundreds of thousands of people. Does that make the United States a murderous place? No. Does it say something about the United States? Yeah, it does. We can discuss, and we should, what it does. But a wholesale denunciation? No. Particular people at a particular time made some unspeakable decisions that we have to fa we have to take ownership. Anyone who's, who wants to defend the Soviet Union has to own what Stalin did. You, I got, what happened here? How was that possible? And you know, much of socialism after Stalin has been devoted to how do you deal with that problem to make sure it never happens again. Again, Americans like to imagine they're the only ones that see this as a problem? Not true. Only ignorance keeps that crap going. I've been to countless conferences around the world where the issue has been, how do you make sure that doesn't happen again? How, how does socialism take ownership of that problem, et cetera, et cetera? And if there are in the room Marxists who say that's not a real problem we have, they usually get shot down and not pleasantly. I, I don't mean physically. I mean you know, argumentatively shot down uh, because it's not an acceptable kind of argument. None of that is sort of taken into account. But again, that's the peculiarity of the United States, which does not. Look, I'm an economist. Let me give you two very simple. In the United States economics profession in the university, there are two basic positions. One is called neoclassical economics, which is overwhelmingly dominant, and a small resistant criticism comes from something called Keynesian economics, okay? And they fight each other, and they push each other out of departments and hire their the people they like, and endless. It's been going on for many decades. One of the few things the neoclassicals and the Keynesians agree on is not to hire and not to deal with Marxian economics. What do you do with it? Well, they've succeeded. Marxian economics are very few and very far between. These days, more of them are coming which I'm very happy about. But for a good while, I was one of the few. And because I went to all the pedigree universities, you know my name, not the others. But that's not because I'm better, more important, more prolific, or anything else. It's only the pedigree, because that's how this system works. But I can assure you that all of these conversations like yours with me, and not because of your fault or my fault, would be very different if we didn't silence that community and block them from introducing their perspectives into our conversations of all these topics. That's the loss to the American intellectual community, and it works at many, many levels. We will have no conversation about Pete Buttigieg's father. And it's not because of anything wrong with Pete or anything wrong with his father. It's just a taboo that keeps all that stuff away. Sad. It's really, it's a sadness for me. It's a, and to those of you that are watching, you're losing out on a rich, wonderful literature 
Not that you'll agree with all of it. Who cares? But that it will bring you insights that you will like or hate and provoke you in ways that will make you a better thinker about what you focus on than you are without engaging that literature. Your loss and ours because it's less you can contribute to the rest of us. Hmm. Well, toward wrapping up with just a couple final thoughts, I mean, the colonial genocide, the Mongolian genocide, the Crusades, even the Neanderthal genocides, they're all distinctly non-Marxist and singling out China or Russia or Cambodia is, again, just cherry picking evidence to support the anti-Marxist criticism. But I think it was it's really important that you stressed that even a devout Marxist like you doesn't think of Marx as an infallible God. I mean, Marxism is an evolving family of theories, and this goes hand in hand with your description of these different forms of socialism. Uh, but again, Richard, thank you so much for continuing the conversation with me. You're, you really are such a terrific order, and I, I love speaking with you. And I'm sorry that my co-host was a bit more disruptive than usual. But again, thanks so much. No, your co-host, I thought, behaved wonderfully and have no objection at all. It's a pleasure talking to you, and I appreciate that you're open enough to explore these issues. Really, that's that's all I'm after. Thank you very much. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Earhart.